are recording this today because the guitars said, oh, please, would you record the talk today so that they can watch it where they are up in their summer home. We are delighted today to have Melissa Davis from uh, the BMI, from, I'm sorry, the Marshall Foundation. She is the director of uh, the library and of archives. And we've had her here before for another talk, uh, which um, she's a very engaging speaker. And we're delighted uh, to have her come again to talk about William, well, Elizabeth Smith Friedman and William, her husband, who were code breaking during the 20th century. And I think their story is really very interesting about how they did that. Notice how she spells her name. Yeah. It's different. Um, code breaking is something that's very interesting and we only recently have been able to be finding out more because of course all of this was top secret and so now we're learning more about it. So please welcome, oh I have asked, oh turn off your cell phones and I have asked Melissa if she will tell you about uh, some of the talks at, coming up at the Marshall Foundation and some of the details uh, about them. So Melissa. everyone gets to enjoy this and that the recording goes well. So coming up, tomorrow night we have a legacy lecture um, with Lieutenant Colonel Tom Arnold, who is a uh, Army Chief of Staff Good Pastor Scholar at University of Virginia. And he is going to be talking about the Army's first public relations snafu um, at the beginning of World War II. And I think it's going to be very interesting it involves um, General Ben Lear and some soldiers who decided to yoo-hoo at some women in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, and, and it really is, is a very engaging story. Um, uh, Colonel Arnold has been researching at the Marshall Foundation for his PhD for the last year or so. So he's become a, a, a common sight there and a friend. In October, we have a lovely presentation um, on the military newspapers of World War II and how important it was that soldiers had a voice. Um, and so we have um, um, a great presentation about how they came about and how they were supported, where they got their information, how they were received. Um, generally, they were received well on the enlisted side and maybe not so well all the time on the I think it will be very interesting. And in November, I am very excited. We have the chief historian from the CIA coming to speak. Um, he is going to be talking about Marshall and intelligence during the war. Now, I have to tell you, the reason I'm so excited about this one is that most of the documents that we have from the National Archives, we have over a million National Archives documents from the Foundation, were gathered in the 50s and 60s when the intelligence community still had those documents classified. So we don't have a lot on intelligence during World War II. So I plan on bringing my pencil and my paper and taking notes because I'm going to learn. Um, Dr. Robars has just published a book that is freely available on the CIA website to download and read as a PDF. Um, and I am in the middle of it and, and enjoying it very much. So hopefully that gives you some ideas and things to look forward to. And, and it's not too late to come tomorrow evening. Um, if in the morning you would just give the foundation a call and let Lee McFadden know to please count your no's, that would be sufficient. You don't have to make a reservation. And as always, um, now the, mar the, the legacy lectures are free. You do not have to be a member, there is no charge. Um, there isn't a bus going tomorrow night, correct? So you would have to bring yourself there, but it's not that far. And in the evening, parking really isn't such a problem at the foundation. So if you have any questions about those, I'm going to stay afterwards. If you didn't have a chance to look at the really cool gadgets up here, I'll be here afterwards for you to look, and you certainly can ask me any questions. So with that, no further ado, we will get started. Okay, I'm told you have a bus schedule in October and you will schedule one in November. So it's only tomorrow night that you would need to bring yourself or carpool with some, with some friends.
Okay? Um, tonight, I am going to be, or this evening, this afternoon, I am going to be talking about William and Elizabeth Smith Friedman. Now, if you're not familiar with who they are, they were some of the foremost code breakers of the first half of the 20th century. And the Marshall Foundation is very blessed to have their papers, their library, their photos. Um, the Freedmen's decided that they didn't want them to go to a large organization or to the National Archives or to the Library of Congress because they wanted them to be kept together and they wanted them to be able to be available, made available to researchers. And so they chose the space and the room at the foundation for them. They're still in there. Um, they aren't as accessible because they chose a room upstairs, but if stairs don't bother you, I'm pleased to take you and show you the Freedmen room anytime you want to come and visit me during the day at the foundation. Um, but they are fascinating, fascinating people. The idea of codes are fascinating, I think. Um, and as we got into the 20th century and the advent of radio, encryption became so important. And some of the work that William and Elizabeth did in the 20s actually led to what keeps our cell phones um, secure as we're texting our children or receiving email from grandchildren. So, so their work is long lasting, um, and I, I want to introduce you to them, and also some of the code um, gadgets, let's call them, some of the code breaking that went on in the first half of the 20th century. Do we want to turn off the, yeah, so everybody can see the screen? Give it a second. There, is that better? You can see well? Okay. Um, so, William and Elizabeth Smith Friedman, um, met at a place called Riverbank in Illinois. It was kind of a, a think tank of the day. The gentleman who ran it gathered the best and the brightest educated young people and had them working on various projects. Elizabeth was from the Midwest. She had graduated from college, which is kind of unusual in the 19 teens for a woman, um, and majored in English Lit. And she was a Shakespeare fanatic. William was actually in grad school at Cornell, uh, when he was pulled into Riverbank, um, he was working with um, fruit flies and he was um, using photography skills to blow up the images so that you could see the differences in the genetics of the fruit flies. Right, he could come to my kitchen any summer afternoon and capture all the fruit flies he needs from canning, the, yeah, exactly. You ladies know exactly what I'm talking about, don't you? Um, they met at this think tank. He was um, a Russian Jew from Pittsburgh, and she came from a, a, um, um, a friend's background in the Midwest. They couldn't be more different, and they hit it off. Elizabeth was working on a project where this woman really was convinced that Francis Bacon had written the Shakespearean plays, and that there were codes embedded in them to indicate that he had. And so Elizabeth, with her Shakespearean background, was pulled into that project. Um, and then they brought William into the project because if you got a chance to look at it, this is the size of the first folio. This is a, a recreation of a print, um, 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 what do I want to call it? The metal that you run the ink on and you run through the printer. Okay, well, I don't know. There's got to be a name for it. I'm not sure. But, but this is the size that they were working with. And the problem, the, 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 the task was to find differences in font. And this was so small that even with magnifying glasses, the women who were working on this project were going half blind. So they pulled William into the project with his photography skills to photograph these printer plates and blow them up so that the women could see if there were differences in font. And that's how William and Elizabeth met. Now, Elizabeth started teaching William everything that she was learning about codes and code breaking. She did a lot of research and study in trying to decipher what she was seeing in the Shakespeare first folio pages. Um, and the two of them realized very quickly that it was bunk, <laughs> that there were no codes in Shakespeare. Shakespeare obviously wrote his own plays. But in the meantime, they had started to research and to learn and to study about Shakespeare. And along the way, um, they got married, much to his mother's chagrin. Um, and as we got closer into World War II, the man who ran 
the think tank said, hmm, the United States military doesn't really have but one person who knows anything about codes, and he certainly can't teach all of the soldiers they're going to need in World War I if we get involved in this war. So he volunteered William and Elizabeth to teach a class to soldiers. This is their first graduating class. In the front of the soldiers is the man who runs the think tank, the woman who was part of the Shakespeare project, Elizabeth, another woman she worked with, and William at the end. And then you have the soldiers in their graduating class. Now I don't know if you can see um, the soldiers very well, but normally when someone takes your picture, don't you usually face the camera? Can you see what some of those soldiers are doing? They're not even looking at the camera. It's actually a code. The picture is a code. Every, every five soldiers is a letter of the alphabet. It's an A, 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 B kind of a code. And what it says is knowledge is power. In this, in this wonderful picture. Now, William and Elizabeth were not teachers and did not have a curriculum, so they were literally building the curriculum at night and teaching it the next day, and building the curriculum at night and teaching it the next day. And we have up here on the table one of the volumes that they used in their, in their curriculum. We have several more back at the foundation. You'll notice that they're not published under William and Elizabeth Smith Friedman. No, it was the gentleman on the left who took the credit for their work and got the copyright and published the volumes. Thank you very much, right? Now, William got to go and ply his code trade in France during World War I. Elizabeth did not. There was a problem, she was a woman. And the fact that she knew just as much about code breaking as her husband did not get her into the military and did not get her to France. So William got to go to France and Elizabeth stayed home. Now these, I have them actually on the table, these round things are individual discs of aluminum with letters printed on them. And this is what they were using around that time. These actually specifically didn't come out until after the war, but they're using something very similar during the war. So that the sending person and the receiving person had to know the order of the discs, the number of discs, to be able, and, the, and how many times to turn it to be able to read the message. The really cool thing about these is the prototype for them were designed by Thomas Jefferson back in the 1750s. Uh, the amazing thing to me is that these very easy, simple, looks like Boy Scouts could use them, Girl Scouts could use them, were in use by the US military up until the beginning of World War II. It was nothing more technical than that. So when the Freedmans were separated, newlyweds, madly in love, they wrote love letters and they included codes in their love letters. And as you can see here, there, this, this, this two lines is not a word at all, is it? If I step up on the stage, am I getting too far from things up there? No? Okay, let's try this. Well, maybe. Okay, if you look, if you look at the, the bottom letter, the J, and you go up to the top letter and across to the T and down to the A and over to the D, and you make that pattern across there, it says, yeah, what? Yeah, it says I love you in French. So they included codes even in their love letters. They were so they, they so enjoyed it. It was such a part of their life. Um, after the war, William stayed with Army Signals Intelligence. They left Riverbank and they moved to Washington, DC. And um, I looked at that picture and I said, Oh, I don't have to It's very, very obviously Great Falls, Virginia. They were excited to move to the district. They were excited to be part of this new world opening up. Radio was coming into being and codes were, were more than just a military wartime communication. They were becoming something um, from everyday government and civilian communication. Now, finally, after the war, they got to start their family. They had a daughter and then a couple of years later, a son. Um, this is the home that they built on Military Road in Washington, D.C. It's still there. And I'm sure that the people who own it are probably tired of people stopping and taking pictures because an author who published a book about Elizabeth put the address in the book. Oh. <laughs> I would think I put up a sign and said, go away. <laughs> I could get off my lawn. Um, but 
But Elizabeth was very happy to finally be a mother. Uh, she was in her 20s when they married. She was in her 30s when they finally got to start their family because the war interrupted. Um, and she very much wanted to stay at home. William continued to work for the army. And it wasn't, oh, but a couple months after Ramsey was born, the Navy came knocking on the door looking for William. And she said, well, he's working for the Army. And they said, well, what about you? Are you interested in working for the Navy? And she said, well, you know, as you can see, I'm a new mom. But if you bring me the messages in the morning, while the children are eating and napping and playing nicely together in the backyard, and I'm watching them, I will decode them during the day. And then the next morning, you can take those back and bring me the next go round." And the Navy said, okay. Now, obviously, today that would not work. I mean, taking classified documents home is a big issue today. <laughs> but in those days, they were just so happy to have someone who could actually decode the messages. They had six months worth of backlog, and she got it caught up in two weeks. <laughs> she was amazing. Elizabeth could see patterns. And when she had enough messages using the same, or suspected to use the same code book, she was able to literally drill down through and see where the letters were used more often and be able to come up with some words like the and of and and that are, that are short, and she used those to solve the rest of the message. So she was the original stay-at-home working mom in 1926. Now, I told you the Friedmans liked their codes, they sent coded Christmas cards to friends and family. And so you would take this Christmas card and you would have to cut out the red part and poke holes in it. And believe me, I tried. The hole punch does not reach to the middle. You have to take a pencil and stick it in there and try not to poke, you know, tear the red paper. And then you would have to align it over the grid on the right and turn it the direction the, the arrows indicate so that you could read the message. Um, this is another one of their coded Christmas cards. Um, and my daughter, who plays the piano, played it and said, oh my gosh, this is not a song. But as you see, the key is on the right bottom. And so you figure out what the letters are of the chord. Remember that every good boy deserves fudge, right? Face, right? So you figure out what the chords are, and you, and you find the letter corresponding to those chords and you read the message. <laughs> they put a lot of time into these. Now, um, the coded Christmas cards that we have, I brought copies on the piano. Afterwards, please help yourself if you think you'd like to, to, to break them. They're just a lot of fun to mess around with. Um, this is one of Elizabeth's worksheets. She didn't work for the Navy very long. There was something going on in the 20s called Prohibition. And the problem with prohibition is there were still people who wanted to drink, and so they were illegally importing alcohol into the United States. And the tiny little bitty Coast Guard could not keep up with their communications to find these big motherships sitting in international waters that were offloading into the South Coast that were bringing the alcohol into the United States from literally Long Island all the way down the Gulf of Mexico and all the way up the Pacific Coast. There wasn't any part of the United States coastline that was immune to the importation of alcohol. And so the um, Coast Guard came to Elizabeth and said, we want to hire you away from the Navy. We need you. And, and, and she said, OK. <laughs> and Elizabeth was the only woman working for the Coast Guard at the time. Um, and she was their chief cryptographer. And she pioneered the use of radio triangulation to find the motherships. Now, radio triangulation is that when you have a radio broadcast, if you have two receiving points, you can use triangulation to figure out where the broadcast came from. And it was really the, the pioneering use of radio triangulation for law enforcement, and law enforcement uses it to this day. And so she was able to tell the Coast Guard, this is where the mothership is laying off the coast of New York or Louisiana or Oregon in international waters. And the Coast Guard would go and wait for the fast ships to come into US waters and then arrest them. Now, this displeased some people, as you can well imagine. Um, there was a company called Consolidated Exporters. They call it Conexco. Um, it was owned by a man named Joseph P. Kennedy, whose son became president of the United States. And some of the importers who got his alcohol were named Capone. 
<laughs> so you can imagine that, that when Elizabeth um, had to go and testify in New Orleans at a big, big bust with 24 defendants, that the US government sent security with her to look out for her. They were worried for her safety. They needed her and they didn't want anything to happen to her. And in this testimony, the 24 defense attorneys said, who is this five foot two middle-aged woman from Indiana? What the heck does she know? We think she's, you know, this is hogwash. You're, you're pulling the wool over her eyes. And she turned to the judge and she said, will you bring me chalk and a chalkboard? And she taught a class on how to break codes right there on the witness stand. And at the end of her little impromptu class, the defense attorney said, okay, we grant she is an expert. She knows what she's talking about. And all four of the men indicted were convicted because of Elizabeth's testimony. Now, there were no computers in those days. This is how Elizabeth broke those codes. These are some of her actual worksheets. It was pencil and paper and a lot of hard work. Um, you can see that the letters up top were generally in groups of five. She just wrote them all along there. Because the words didn't always break at five letters. So she would just write them all up there. Um, and then she used down here below a frequency count because there are some letters that appear a lot more frequently in the alphabet than others. She also knew that some of these, um, the, the um, rum runners would start their message or end their message in the same way. And so sometimes that gave her a foot in the door. But it was a lot of hard work to figure out, um, you know, there's, there's the plain text right underneath. And you can see that this is coming in where? Nantucket. This is another one of her worksheets. Um, we don't see quite the same work at the top, but then the plain text at the bottom. Parcel mailed Havana today by William Hood containing forged Honduran ship papers. So it was, a, it was another way of getting alcohol into the United States was to put it in a container and call it something else. So while Elizabeth was working for the Navy and the Coast Guard, William was still working for the Army, Signals Intelligence Service. Um, he was in charge of the, the group. This was his group. This was his entire team. This was the entire Signals Intelligence Service headquarters of the United States Army in the 1930s. Not very large, right? And don't get me wrong. The woman is not a secretary. She's a code breaker. Women have been part of code breaking from the very beginning because they've, they've learned in science since then that women see patterns that men don't. The, the minds work literally biologically differently. And so women have been involved in code breaking from the beginning. Um, this group, um, the, the commercial code machine makers during the 20s and 30s, because people were using radio to communicate, you know, AT&T is talking to its people in California from Virginia by radio, and anyone who had that frequency could listen in. This is a problem, right? So they used these commercial cryptography machines to encrypt their communication so that it could be sent over the radio waves with a bunch of gobbly, gobbledygook letters and then interpreted on the other end so that they could have secure um, communications for the company. And this machine was made by a company in France. And so a lot of these companies wanting the US government to buy their machine would send it to the signals intelligence team and they would try to break it. Well, that little group I just showed you broke this machine in two hours and 20 minutes, um, which floored everyone and made the company in, in France that made them go bankrupt because nobody wanted to buy their machines if they were that easy to break. Um, so the children are growing up. We're edging to the end of the 30s. Um, they're in their teenage years. The family's doing well. William has um, moved from his little bitty signals intelligence group to a place in um, Northern Virginia called Arlington Hall. Anybody heard of Arlington Hall? It was a girls' school uh, before the war. But the Signals Intelligence Service had grown and they had started employing a lot of college girls uh, who not all of them were mathematics. Sometimes they were not math people at all, but they had taken, they had given these college girls this test to see how they could think outside the box, how logical they were. And they trained them to be code breakers. 
mainly because they were inexpensive because they were women. And because the soldiers, had, you know, we, we were going to have to have all of the men who could enlist to go serve overseas if we got involved in World War II. And so teaching women to be the code breakers made sense for them. So William is working at, at Arlington Hall. Now, um, of course, we have a new code machine for World War II. The little round gadget with the discs on it was not going to be sufficient anymore. Um, we're doing more and more now at this point in time with machine codes. And this is called the M209. It is what they developed in the very early 40s and was used throughout the war. Um, it was actually built by Smith Corona typewriter because they have the machining ability to make these teeny tiny little parts that they used in this machine. Um, and sitting up here, and you certainly can look at it afterwards, uh, you should know that this does not require electricity and it weighs about six pounds. So it's a very portable, eminently portable. And there were some 400,000 of them used by, by US and allied forces during World War II. This is the um, headquarters staff of signals intelligence. It's, it's bigger now than the whole staff was just a few years before at Arlington Hall. Uh, William Friedman is sitting in the civilian clothes on the right. Um, there's a story that goes along with his civilian clothes. Well, he's the only one, well, there are two there, three there in civilian clothes, but he had been an officer in the army all those years. He had never been demobbed after World War I. Um, he worked on a project in 39 and 40 that was the Japanese diplomatic code. And if somebody can see this and would like to read what is up here on the screen, or I can read it for you, but you probably get tired of listening to me. <laughs> Does somebody want to read it or should I read it? Okay, I'll read it. Um, this is a quote from Elizabeth talking about William and his team working on this Japanese diplomatic code at the time. He said, um, they didn't even know when they started working with those cipher messages that it was a machine cipher. There's all the difference in the world between machine cipher and paper cipher. Machine cipher can go into hundreds and billions of computations. You can start from here and go to the end of the world and never have a repetition. So that's what they were up against in trying to break this code. They called this code purple. The previous code had been orange, and this was a different different code, and so they called it purple. Um, breaking the purple code was not easy um, because we have the fact that whereas before, generally, if an A was a C, it was always a C. Now, if an A was a C the first time, it might be an E the second time and an X the third time. So there is no repetition, and it's really rough, but when they got their foot in the door in the fall of 40, um, it was actually one of the code girls that made the first break on this Japanese cipher, um, that they were able to come up with some of the letters and fill in the blanks down below. You know, there's a lot of fill in the blanks here. Um, and breaking that Japanese diplomatic code was such a huge undertaking and a huge coup for the United States government. Now, I, we could read the, di the Japanese diplomatic messages. Unfortunately, the Japanese diplomatic messages did not tell us when and where Pearl Harbor attack was going to take place. There was going to be an attack, it didn't say when and it didn't say where, because this was not a military code, it was a diplomatic code. And so when Pearl Harbor came, William fell apart. He absolutely collapsed and was hospitalized. The, the trauma of thinking, what did we miss? Could we have gotten it sooner? Why didn't we figure it out? As the news reports came in from Pearl Harbor, were just more than he could take after those grueling 120 hour weeks sometimes trying to break this code. And so the Army said, well, you're unfit for duty, so we're going to make you a civilian now. But he was still in charge of Arlington Hall. Now, the upside of breaking the code is that throughout the entire war, the Japanese government had a, a, um, a presence in Berlin, Germany. They still had an, an embassy there, and it was staffed. And so the, the, um, the Japanese ambassador in Berlin would send messages to Tokyo and they would be read in Washington before they even arrived in Tokyo. And so the entire war, what Hitler was planning, what was going on, what was coming up, um, we were reading those messages. So we not only knew what was going on in Tokyo's mind, we also knew what was going on in Germany's mind. And it helped a lot with planning, with planning the battles. 
For instance, the Germans were absolutely convinced that we were going to come um, uh, not onto Omaha and Utah beaches in Normandy, but that we were gonna come across further over. They absolutely thought that Patton and the army that he had amassed there, the ghost army, was actually the real invasion. And we knew that from the messages. The really cool thing is that neither the Germans nor the Japanese during the entire war knew we were reading the mail. They never figured out that we had broken it. Um, this is William's quote on breaking this, this code. He said, the successful solution is the culmination of 18 months of intensive study. What he doesn't say there is literally 100 hour weeks. Um, by a group of cryptanalysts and assistants, the assistants, those were the college girls, uh, working as a harmonious, well-coordinated, and cooperative team. Only by such cooperation and close collaboration of all concern could the solution possibly have been reached. And the name of no one person can be selected as deserving of the major portion of credit for this achievement. So it was really a team effort by about 120 people working hugely long weeks to get this taken care of, but what a coup for the government. So during World War II, Elizabeth had been working for the Coast Guard. Well, in wartime, the Coast Guard was pulled into the Navy. So suddenly she found herself working for the Navy. And whereas in the Coast Guard, she ran her own shop. She was the chief cryptanalyst for the Coast Guard. The Navy had a policy that really stunk. And it was that a woman could not be in charge of a department, period, end of story. So they said, oh, by the way, you're now working for the Navy and here's your boss. And it was a guy who didn't know half of what she knew about code breaking. And to her irritation, throughout the entire war, he was taking credit for all of her work. It was going out under, you know, on, on his stationery with his signature. Um, and she didn't say anything, but I know it really galled her. She said later in life that really, really bothered her that, that her, she wasn't getting credit for her work. She said it wasn't that many people could know what I was doing because it was so secret, but it would have been nice if the people she was working for had known that it was her effort that was making this transpire. And we only have two pictures of Elizabeth at work. Elizabeth hated to have her picture taken at work, did not like it. So there's this one, and there's this one. Um, Elizabeth still, even though she wasn't in charge of the department, got to hire her own personnel. Um, she only had five or six for William Hunt 120. The Navy had a very small footprint in, in breaking code, but they had a very important job during the war. You see, there were German spies all up and down the east coast of the United States and down into some, you know, South America, and they were sitting at the ports, and they were radioing to the U-boats when a troop ship left, when a supply ship left, what bearing it was taking, right? They would ask around the port to see if they could get someone to tell them where it was going, what it contained. And so during the Battle of the Atlantic, we were losing ships right and left with materials that England needed, lend lease equipment, you know, soldiers and sailors, and, and we just had trouble getting things over there. And so they gave Elizabeth the task of locating these spies because she had the expertise with the radio triangulation. And so she would catch them making a transmission and then try to figure out where it came from. And this was from you know, New York down um, the coast of Georgia, Florida, Jacksonville, down into Brazil. Um, it was her area to work. She found out very quickly that these spies were generally not from Germany. They were from the United States, they were from Brazil, um, that had a, a still an allegiance to Germany. And so they were very particular to let everyone know that they were supportive, that they were true, true Germans. And so they started every message with, you wanna guess? Heil Hitler. And they ended every message with, Heil Hitler, and on Hitler's birthday, every single one of them sent a message, happy birthday. <laughs> and you know, the, the, that laziness, that, that, that sternness they thought they were showing their patriotism really actually helped Elizabeth break the codes because she was able to again get the foot in the door. Now the irony of all of this is as she was locating these spies, they would be, um, they would be arrested by the FBI. Now, we didn't have a CIA, so the FBI in those days still worked overseas, like down in Brazil. And so they would swoop in and arrest the spies. And you know something? Um, there was a guy in charge of the FBI, his name was J. Edgar Hoover. 
irritated him to no end that their best cryptographer was this middle-aged woman about five foot two from Indiana. And he literally had her name removed, redacted from every single document that it appeared in that the FBI, FBI had in their records because he wanted no one to know. It did not fit the G-man, he-man agent that he wanted to portray. And so he really had her removed. So Elizabeth can't talk about what she does because of the Secrecy Act. And nobody knows that she did it because her name doesn't appear in any of the documents that have been since declassified. So is it any wonder she kind of disappeared from history until about hmm, six or eight years ago. Uh, this is a picture actually of the Queen Mary. And there's a reason I have it up here. Um, my dad was from Washington, D.C. and in 1938, he joined the 29th Infantry, this National Guard unit, still in this area today, because he was getting married and it was the Depression and he needed the money. So in 1940, 41, the National Guard units were federalized by the War Department because you can't build an army out of nothing. You can't just have brand new lieutenants and brand new privates and call it a division. I mean, that nobody knows what's going on. So what he did was he used these National Guard units as, as skeletons that they could add the soldiers being drafted to to build this army of 16 million military people that they were going to need. Um, and, and so my dad was federalized in February of 41. The 29th Infantry went over to England in October of 42 on the Queen Mary, which had been turned into a troop ship. Now in Elizabeth's records, mind you, we have all of her records because the entire 20 years she worked for the government, she was considered a temporary employee, so they didn't keep any of her papers. Everything that she kept, we have, and nobody else has any. Not even the Coast Guard that are building a cutter and naming it after they had to call me for information. So, so we know from her records that there were several times that she saved a Queen Mary going across the Atlantic. Sometimes the South Atlantic, sometimes the North Atlantic. We're not sure that she saved it when the 29th went over, but I'm sure glad that she did if she did, because I'm standing here because of it. <laughs> and the 29th, mind you, was on Omaha Beach on D-Day. Took some of the bloodiest parts of Omaha Beach. You heard of the Bedford boys, right? That's the 29th. And so if they hadn't made it to England, I wouldn't be here talking to you, but how might D-Day have been different without those troops available to fight? So I put Queen Mary up here because it really tells you how far-reaching Elizabeth's spy-breaking was during the war. The Enigma, right? Everybody's heard of the Enigma, right? It was the unbreakable German cryptography machine. Um, the first we knew of it actually came from Poland. They captured one from a Navy, a German Navy ship in Poland. And the Polish scientists were working on it when in September of 1939, Hitler rolled over their country and some of the scientists escaped to England and they took what they knew and they captured the machine that they had to Bletchley Park. Does this sound familiar? Bletchley Park was England's version of Arlington Hall. Um, and they were working on breaking the Enigma. Well, obviously they weren't the only ones working on breaking the Enigma. We were working on breaking the Enigma at the same time. In fact, the Army was working on it and the Navy was working on it completely separately. The Secrecy Act meant that although William was the chief cryptographer for the Army and Elizabeth was the chief cryptographer for the Navy, they couldn't talk to each other and they couldn't work together even though they were married. Um, you know that how do you give the people doing their TS clearance heartburn? How do you give somebody security clearance when they're married to somebody who does the same job and they, you have to tell them they can't talk about it? Um, I honestly believe that the competition that historically existed between the Army and the Navy, they didn't cooperate well. Um, General Marshall started the whole idea of the Chiefs of Staff because he, they needed to work together to win this war and not bunk heads with each other. Um, I really honestly think that the Navy talked to Bletchley Park and the Army talked to Bletchley Park more than they talked to each other on code breaking, which is sad. Because I think that if they let William and Elizabeth work together like they had earlier in their life, how much quick, how quickly would we have gotten the Enigma broken? Now, breaking the Enigma was great, but decoding the message was impossibly slow because there were so many settings on the Enigma. So the folks at Arlington Hall put their heads together. This is a picture of how it works. There's one up here. Um, basically, you type on the keyboard. It goes down below to the steckers in red. 
It goes up through the rotors, hits a mirror, comes back through the rotors, comes back through the stickers, and then appears on the lamp on the top. It lights up as a letter. And it, a letter can never be itself, and it will never be the same thing twice. So William and the people at Arlington Hall said, we have got to come up with a faster way to decode these messages because lives depend on it. Um, this whole idea was called magic. That was, that was, magic was the idea that we had figured out not only the Japanese diplomatic code, but we had broken the enigma. So we're reading the German communication straight now. So the guys and gals in Arlington Hall got together and they built this contraption that's like, oh, it's almost the size of a coffin. I mean, I'm just going to describe to you how large this thing is. The NSA Museum has one up there. Um, but they used telephone switches, and they reverse engineered this enigma that they had never seen. They didn't, we didn't have one in the United States to, to model after. And, and so what they were able to do is they were able to get the settings from the enigma, and they would run it through this machine, and it would spit out this plain text at the other end. So they were decoding messages that much faster. Now, there was a visit from Arlington Hall representatives over to Bletchley Park, early-ish in the war. And the British were not altogether trustworthy, um, trusting the Americans' abilities. Here, again, were Johnny come latelys to the war. They had already been fighting for a while, just like in World War I. And they didn't think we knew diddly squat about codes. They hadn't met the Friedmans. So these representatives go over to Bletchley Park, and the British have already decided they're going to only crack open their door of knowledge a few inches wide. They're not going to share much with the Americans because they didn't trust us. We were kind of green, they thought. And here come the jolly Americans with this big contraption in this big crate that they hauled in by truck to Bletchley Park. And the Americans made a gift of a duplicate of that big contraption to Bletchley Park so that they could then run the messages through and get them that much faster. And the Brits said, oh, this is very nice. And they threw open the doors and everything the Brits knew, the Americans knew. And really, honestly, in the years since then, that, that door's never been closed. It really was the opening to a very warm relationship between the English, you know, the, the United Kingdom, and the Americans with regard to codes and code breaking and intelligence. We've shared very well since then. Now, there was a problem with this gift. Remember I told you they built it with AT&T switches? Well, you know what AT&T had to say about that? Holy cow, we can't have foreigners looking at our technology. Bring that thing back here. And so um, the word got over to Bletchley Park that they were going to have to give it back. So there was the liaison to the United States from the, the British Chiefs of Staff, who's a man named Sir General um, Field Marshal Sir John Dill. So Dill gets this message, hey, we're told we have to send this, con this contraption back because at and is unhappy. And Dill's like, what? So he goes straight to General Marshall because they're great buddies and they work together on things. And he says, what in the world? And Marshall goes to Arlington and calls on the hall and says, what in the world? And they're like, well, this is what at and say. And Marshall said, you tell AT&T, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> the Brits are going to keep their machine. And, and you know everything is super classified anyway, so it's not like the British telecom people were going to get a look at all of the technology. It was so closely held in a locked room at Bletchley Park, and only a few people were allowed to know that it existed or to use it. But I think it's really cool. If you ever get up to the NSA Museum, it's this huge thing about six feet long and about four feet wide. Um, and it literally took a truck to move it. Um, now, in the, the Friedman's careers, it started together at Riverbank, and they had deviated during their careers, which were parallel but different. He with the Army, she with the Coast Guard and the Navy. At the end of the war, um, Elizabeth was made redundant. No surprise there, right? We don't need you anymore. We have all these men who can do what you do, so mm, sayonara. Which was actually okay with Elizabeth. She was very ready to just stay at home. Um, the long hours had worn on her, and she was really worried about William's health, which had never really recovered after his breakdown. So she felt like being at home when he got home at the end of the day and could make sure he was actually eating dinner and things was a good idea. Um, shortly thereafter, William became the chief cryptographer for the brand new, it had several names, but we know it now as the NSA. 
Um, and he did that for a few years. Um, his health really started to fail. He had a weak heart, several heart attacks, and he too retired. So now we have these two brilliant minds that have spent all these years honing their ability in cryptography. And so what do they go back to work on once they can work together again? It's Shakespeare. <laughs> they decided that they needed to do further research and publish a book that definitively laid to rest that rumor that Bacon had written Shakespeare's plays and that there were codes in the plays. Though Shakespeare wrote his own plays, there are no codes. It's delightful reading, but there are no codes. And so they did research at several places they sold their house on Military Road. The children were grown, and it was entirely too big for the two of them, and it had stairs, which William didn't really need to do. And they bought a little town home on Capitol Hill that was a walking distance of the Folger Shakespeare Library, where they did a lot of the research for this book. And they published this book in 1957 that really laid to rest. Now, Elizabeth hated the title. They did not get to choose the title, and the publisher chose the title. She said it makes it sound like there's actually a chance that there's codes in Shakespeare. She hated it. She said they should have called it, there are no codes. She was kind of a plain spoken woman. Um, and during this time, they were still involved with the, the intelligence, even as retired people. There was a man overseas in Europe, his name was Boris Haglund, and he built commercial cryptography machines. And he was still sending prototypes to the Freedmen's who had, as retirees, would try to break them. Uh, I, have a, I have this one right here on the table over there. This is a completely mechanical device. It, it fits in your hand and fits in an overcoat pocket, and it was used on both sides during the Cold War because it didn't require electricity and you could carry it around with, you know, in a purse or an overcoat pocket, a suit coat pocket, and no one would know you had it. Um, and they helped develop this machine um, to be as good as it was with, with Boris Haglund. And then, of course, they got to spend time together again. This is a picture of them in their little garden in back of their home on Capitol Hill. Um, they were sharp dressers their whole life, and I love that he's wearing a beret, and I just think they look so happy. They did a lot of traveling after they retired. They went to England, they went to Scandinavia, they went to Europe. Um, they started learning Mayan languages and starting to translate things from Central America. Um, and they thoroughly enjoyed being together. I mean, they really had a 50-year love affair with each other. They were, they were a team. Even when they worked separately, they were a team. Uh, William, actually, you know, he, he was very forward-thinking. His, his wife was his companion and his partner and his teammate, and they were very equal to each other, and, and they took care of each other, and they looked out for each other. Um, William died of a heart attack in 1969. They had already decided to give their collections to the Marshall Foundation, but Elizabeth had to finish the bibliography of everything um, after William passed. Um, and then when she died a few years later, she was buried with him because that's how they do it in Arlington Cemetery. They were together in life, and they're together in death. Uh, and you can go and see their stone. The day that I was there was a very, very hot day in June, and somebody had been there just a day before and left a flower. So I know that, that there are still people who who admire and visit the Freedmen's, and I'm glad to know that they do. So, um, I'm glad to answer any questions you have, and there's my email. If you wish to come and see the Freedmen Room, just mind that it is upstairs. Um, and if you have any more questions after we're done tonight and you want me to answer them, shoot me an email. Thank you very much. question because we're taping this. Um, the question was um, um, what recognition have they finally gotten in the last few years and what organizations did they did they set up? Like what do you have in mind? I'm trying to think organizations. They have buildings. Oh, oh yeah of course I can absolutely talk about that. So um, because the Freedmen's couldn't talk about what they did during wartime um, they had to sign the Secrecy Act and basically said, no, at no point in time can you ever talk about what you're doing in your job. Um, because um, you know, FBI had erased Elizabeth from history, um, the NSA came and raided their private library at home in 1958. 
and, and took a lot of things that they had created, like these documents in World War I, um, and stamped them secret, even though they'd never been made secret before. And William was just bamboozled by that. He was like, the Boy Scouts do more than this. Third world countries are not even interested in these documents. This is World War I stuff. Why do you want it? But they hauled out part after part of their materials. Not only that, but they pulled the cards that identified the items. So we don't even know exactly what they took because they didn't leave a record with the Freedmans of what they had removed. Um, now, most of the things that William, that are attached to William's name at the NSA have been um, declassified in 2017. They can be accessed online. They never returned the originals to the Marshall Foundation, just saying. Um, and and so, so they're getting out there because their documents are finally being declassified. The irony is that the Brits declassified most of the stuff about Bletchley Park in the 70s. And it wasn't until the 2000 teens that we even started declassifying these things. And I'm like, what are we holding on to? That attitude of, oh my gosh, it was good in World War I, so we have to make it secret, seems to have continued in time with regard to our government. Um, but the NSA did honor William by, um, by naming the auditorium after him. There's a picture here on the table of the bust that they made on the dedication day. And I love Elizabeth. Um, who's been without her husband several years now, her, the great love of her life, how she's gazing up at this bust with such love as if William was standing right there with her. Um, and in the last few years, they've actually renamed the auditorium the William and Elizabeth Smith Friedman Auditorium. So finally, Elizabeth is getting the, the notice that she's due. Um, the Coast Guard is building a cutter, and it's the first one that they've named after a civilian, and it's Elizabeth. Um, and it should, they laid the keel on it. Things are kind of slow moving forward. It's being built at Ingalls Shipbuilding down in Pascagoula, Mississippi. Um, but they hope to have it done in the next 18 months to two years. I'm scamming away to get down there. <laughs> they, don't, they don't have christenings where they like bang the champagne on it anymore. They just slide it out into the water. But, but I, you know, my thing is, hey, you're doing something you've never done before. Let's make a big deal out of it. Let me bring some of these things and, and, and help people learn a little bit more about who Elizabeth Friedman was. Um, so so there, are, there are things coming about. There have been several books written about William in the last 30 years. He was more well known because he stayed long enough to be part of the NSA. Um, but just in the last eight or 10 years, we've had researchers start to do research at the Marshall Foundation and write about Elizabeth. Um, the librarian who preceded me was a lovely, lovely person named Paul Barron, and you might know who I'm talking about. I am so lucky to have been hired and trained by him. But every time a researcher would come to the Marshall Foundation to do research, even if it had nothing to do with the Freedmans, he would say, you've got to write about this woman. <laughs> and so finally, in like 2016, there was a, 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 a newspaper man from San Francisco named Jason Bagomi, who came to do something completely separate, who started reading and fell in love with Elizabeth and her papers and her story. And so he wrote this book called The Woman Who Smashed Codes, which really threw open Elizabeth's story. Um, several years ago, there was also an American Experience PBS show um, made. We, I worked with the researchers during COVID. They couldn't come here to do research. So we Zoomed and we made hard drives and sent them back and forth to each other as they worked on this documentary. Um, there's been another young adult book written about Elizabeth, more the person Elizabeth than Jason's book is more about the career Elizabeth. Um, that I, I didn't, I knew it was a young adult book, but I stayed up all night reading it because it was so engaging. Um, so their stories are finally getting out there. People are starting to become more aware of who they are. Um, they're not a secret anymore. I think that honestly, it probably would embarrass both of them to know that people were making documentaries and writing books about them because they were kind of private, ordinary people who like to play with their kids and have dogs and grow flowers in their garden. I mean, they, they just weren't fancy people. Um, but I'm glad to know that they're finally getting, getting better known. Um, at the foundation, the Marshall Papers collection is our largest and definitely most popular, but number two is Elizabeth Smith Friedman. Yes, sir? If she was erased in the FBI records, how did he get unerased? You know, he asked if she was erased from the FBI records, how do you get her unerased? Well, I'll tell you what. If you go to the FBI's website, they have some of their historic cases up there, and there's one called the Doll Woman case. 
Now, I have the notes that show that Elizabeth solved the dog woman case in her collection, but on the FBI website it says, and FBI cryptographer to this day. So I emailed, right, the historian at the FBI, and I was like, dude, can't you at least give William, I mean, give Elizabeth her props at this point in time? Never heard a thing. Crickets. <laughs> so I, I don't know how you unerase her. It doesn't seem like anyone at the FBI is particularly interested in unerasing her because they might have to explain why she was erased in the first place. I don't know. Maybe they just think it's so unimportant at this point in time they don't need to. Um, you know, that is what it is. Yes, sir. I'm interested in that machine you talked about that took a crate and so forth. And when I read about Bletchley Park, they refer frequently to a bomb, B O M B E. Is there some? There actually isn't, um, and the question was, is there a connection between the contraption that William and his team built at Arlington Hall with the AT&T switches and the bomb, B-O-M-B-E machine, that they developed at Bletchley Park and then we actually built and used here in the United States as well. No, there were two ways of getting the messages, um, and, and, and I don't know that either was faster, or um, I do know that the bomb machines were much easier to recreate than the contraption that William built. Now the bomb machines were something the prototypes have been brought by the Poles to Bletchley Park early in the war, and a guy named Alan Turing at Bletchley Park um, developed the bomb machines. They were these huge, they have one at the NSA Museum. They're huge, they're about nine feet tall and about 12 feet long, and they tell me that when they operated, the women had to wear earplugs and it still damaged their hearing. They were so loud. But basically, it was an early computer that was doing the footwork for, for the cryptographers. Um, now, England, of course, developed the bomb machine, but they didn't have the ability to build them because they were so busy trying to not lose the war, right? I mean, England was so close. France was occupied, and England was just a couple hours ferry ride away. And so they were making munitions, they weren't making bomb machines. So what they did was they shared the plans with the US. And the US went to a company called National Cash Register in Ohio, and they built a lot of those bomb machines. Now, the bomb machines in the United States were um, basically, they were, they were um, stationed in Cathedral Hill in Northwest Washington, D.C., like near the Washington Cathedral. There was a, another school up there that the, US, the government took over and the Navy women ran them. Um, and, and they ran them 24-7. They were very cantankerous, these bomb machines would break down. So they had Navy women running them and Navy women fixing them. Um, and, and I think that, that that's another you know, indication that George Marshall said, we can't win this war without our women. And I think that's another indication of that. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, in, in the Pacific during World War II, the Japanese code was broken and it was a real key in the Battle of Midway. What can you tell us about that? Um, so the question is the Japanese code and how it, it played into the, the Battle of Midway. Um, well, of course, everyone knows we won Midway, right? And the Japanese code is a lot of the reason why. We had no idea where the ships were. We knew they were somewhere, but I'll, I'm here to tell you, although I haven't spent a lot of time in the Pacific, my husband has, and he said, you fly forever and you never see land, you never see an island, it's just water. He said it's like nothing he's ever experienced before. And, and so you can hide ships in there a lot easier than you can if you're playing Battleship the game, right? Um, and, and so we were really struggling because we knew that they were asking for an attack, but we didn't know where. And so it was through breaking of purple magic um, that cryptographers based in Hawaii actually received the, the radio transmission were able to to, to decode it and to give the information to the US so that when the ships got to Midway, we were already there. And of course, you know, I hate to use the word turning point because you can't say that was the turning point of the Pacific War. There were lots of turning points, but it was certainly an important turning point in the war. The Battle of Midway really turned the tide of the, the lack of success that we had against the Japanese in the Pacific to, to um, be able to have a chance of fighting them because we sunk several of their carriers during Midway. And it really gave us, because you know we were still rebuilding our Navy after the disaster of Pearl Harbor, it gave us a foot um, you know, where, where we were on more, more even playing ground. 
Now, I can't give you more detail than that. I would love to be able to say that I had studied the Battle of Midway, um, but although I love World War II history, I have 500 collections. <laughs> And, um, and I just try to stay on top of what I can do. I, you know, librarians don't have to know it all, we have to know where to find it. So if you're interested in knowing more about Midway, come and I will connect you with the Army Green books, the history books, um, and it's fascinating reading if you're a history nerd, um, and you can learn more about Midway. Any other questions? I hope I answered that one okay, although I don't know, uh, you know, the details of Midway are, yeah, they're there somewhere. Any other questions? I think you very much. seen anything up here if you have more questions you want to address to me and hopefully we'll see some of you tomorrow night at 5 30 at the Marshall Foundation for Colonel Arnold's talk on the Army and PR at the beginning of World War II. Yes there is a reception afterwards and there is one. <laughs>